come to get in. I didn't come to get out. I came to get in. So uh, y'all be prepared to put your seatbelts on this morning. We're going to have a little bit of church. Chris read this, and it just, I didn't know he was going to read it. And uh, it stirred my heart. I'm going to read it again because it goes right along uh, with 4th of July. goes right along with what I'm preaching this morning. You want us to turn the pulpit mic off? Uh, no, because I don't have mine on yet. Let's oh, okay. see. Yeah, you can cut it off. That's fine. It says, I like the old paths. And let me say this. I, I, never mind. Let me read it and then I'll say what I'm going to say. I like the old paths. When moms were at home and dads were at work. Brothers went into the army and sisters got married before having kids. Crime did not pay. Hard work did and people knew the difference. Moms could cook. Dads would work and children would behave. Husbands were loving, wives supported, and children were polite. Women wore the jewelry, and men wore the pants. Women looked like ladies, and men looked like men, and kids looked halfway decent. People loved the truth and hated a lie. They came to church to get in, not to get out. Amen. Hymns sounded godly. Sermons sounded helpful. Rejoicing sounded normal and crying sounded sincere. Cursing was wicked. Drugs were for the illnesses that we had. Divorce was unthinkable. The flag was honored. America was beautiful and God was welcome. We read the Bible in pub we read the Bible in public and prayed in school. To be called an American was worth dying for. To be called a Christian was worth living for. To be called a traitor was a shame. That God was worshipped, Christ was exalted, and the Holy Spirit was respected. Yes, I like the old paths. Can I tell you tonight, God has this morning God hasn't changed. Amen. Amen. We may call those old paths, but they're just as new today to God as they were a hundred years ago. Amen. It's not God that's changed. It's not this book that's changed. It's us that have changed. Amen. It's us that have changed. It's us that have changed. Yeah, I like the old paths because they were right. I like the old paths because they were right. If you're in the old way today, you're on the right side. Can I tell you this morning, I'm glad to know, hey, I ain't changing my Bible. I ain't changing my stand. I ain't changing what I believe. I'm going to keep on standing firm. I'm going to keep on being strong. I'm going to keep on going for God. I don't care who likes it. I don't care who lumps it. I don't even care if you fall off in your pew because you don't like it. Amen. I'm going to tell you the truth this morning. Why? Because I'm on the winning side. Amen. You know what? I know I'm on the winning side. Hey, the world is on the losing side. Hey, wickedness is still wrong. Hey, pornography is still wrong. Hey, cussing is still wrong. Hey, my Bible says lying, cheating, and stealing is still wrong. I ain't even, I ain't even opened up my Bible yet. It's not even preaching time yet. I'm still getting ready to sing. I just want you to know I'm not backing down. I'm not backing down. I said I'm not backing down. In case you don't know it yet, I'm not backing down. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm going to stand strong. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't moving. I ain't budging. I'm stubborn. I'm bullheaded. And God called me here. Why? Because I'm on the winning side. Amen. 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 I want you to think about that while I'm singing this song. We're on the winning side. You live already? Mm -hmm. Praise God. I wasn't ready. I should have told you not to. <laughs> Once I drifted out in sin, I had no hope, no joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and He showed me I was wrong, and He placed me on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. Cause I've enlisted in this fight for the cause of truth and right. And praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. From the strength and narrow way 
I was drifting every day out upon the waters deep and wide. But that is all over now, and glory light is on my brow since he placed me on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in this fight for the cause of truth and right. And praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Y'all listen to this now. I will never have a fear for my Lord. He's always near. Amen. And in Him so often I confide. He's the keeper of my soul since He came down and made me whole. And He placed me on the winning side. Well, I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. In case you ain't figured it out yet. You know about you. I'm on the side that's already won. And God's in control of this thing. And God knows what He's doing, and I'm trusting Him. I don't care who fights it. Y'all turn over to Acts chapter number 7 this morning. Acts chapter number 7. Like I said, I didn't come to get out. I came to get in. So I'm going to preach until I get done. And if you don't like it, you can go to the Methodist church down the street where they'll preach to you for 30 minutes, and then you go home. Needless to say, I've been here for a year and two months. Almost three. I'll be here three months this week. Needless to say, maybe I shouldn't say this on live, but I'm going to say it. The honeymoon phase is over. I've learned you. You've learned me. I've kind of treaded real light over the past year. Kind of plowed lightly. I haven't really brought out the tiller yet. Started digging up the ground. Because I've been getting to know you. Been wanting to love on you. Been wanting to find out what kind of people you are. And I've fallen in love with you. And i that's the reason why I can stand here and say the things that I do today. Because I love you. Because I care about you. Because I want what's best for you as your pastor. Amen. As we talked about Wednesday night. Uh, we studied Nathan in the Bible. And Nathan went to David after David had sinned. And Nathan told David. Your fault. He said David it's your fault. We know that David had committed a sin with Bathsheba. He'd already committed the sin of laziness, and laziness turned to lust, and lust turned to uh, adultery, and adultery turned to lying, and lying turned to uh, murder, and all those sins that he had committed, and David was walking around like everything was just normal, and uh, everything was just okay, but Nathan brought it to his attention. You can't say I'm living for God and act like the world. Right. Yeah. It's your fault that you're in the mess that you're in, David. That's what Nathan told him. Nathan was David's pastor. And can I tell you this morning, I'm your pastor. I'm your friend. But when I'm up here, as I said Wednesday night, that friendship, it, it, ain't, it ain't friendship. I become your pastor. When I'm preaching out of this book, I'm to give you what God says. I do care about your feelings. And you know what? I've told you before and I'll say it again. I want you to like me because I like you. I want you to love me because I love you. But I'm not able to preach everything that's in this book and be able for you to walk away and love me all the time. Amen. You know why? Because this book, book's going to tell you the truth. This Amen. book's not going to lie to you. Amen. And I, I believe it. Never mind. I'm following the Holy Ghost, so I better not say that. Brother Jimmy, you pray for us, and then I'm going to read a scripture, and we'll get into it. Please, sir. Father, we just want to come to you now as we uh, get ready for the message, Lord. We know that you've given the preacher one, Lord. We just pray that now we'll open up our hearts, open up our minds, <laughs> receive the message that you've got in store for us, Father. And not only receive it, Lord, act as the Holy Spirit touches our heart and moves us, Lord, that we'll act upon the, what you've told us to do, Lord, and just uh, try to draw a little closer to you, Lord, and do the things you'd have us to do. Lord, let's let your will be done in this service this morning. 
Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 Why so much preaching? Why should we base everything on preaching this morning? Why should our church's foundation be based on the preaching of the Word of God? Why do we have preaching on Sunday morning? Why do we have preaching on Sunday night? Why do we have preaching on Wednesday night? Why do we have preaching at our men's meetings? Why do we have a lesson at the marriage class? Why do you ladies do a lesson at the, at the ladies' meetings? Why do we do a lesson at the senior fellowship? Why so much preaching? Because you need it. That's what this place ought to be based and founded on. Not on the meetings. Not on Easter egg hunts. Not on fun stuff. Hey, all that stuff's good. And I'm thankful for it. And that's one way to reach the community. But you know what the problem with all that stuff is? They don't come in here. Right. For the preaching. 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 You want to know what's going to change America on the 4th of July? Preaching. Right. You know what's going to make a difference in your life and mine today? Preaching. Amen. Hey, we need more preaching. I, I, I come in and I preach for 30 minutes and I look at the clock and that's all good and dandy. But I think we need more preaching. I don't think we get enough preaching. You know why? Because you'll never get enough preaching. Right. You'll never get enough preaching. You know what I do whenever I get in my car and I leave here? I put on some preaching. Me and Brother Chris, you know what we do at least two times every single week? We go hear some preaching. And a lot of places we go, there's two preachers. We went up to Taylorsville Baptist Camp meeting. This, some of you already turned me off. And you know what? You need preaching. We went up to Taylorsville Baptist Camp meeting. And uh, we went up there and we, had, uh, we heard two preachers each night. And we'd drive an hour to get to church. And then when we'd drive an hour, we'd sit there for another hour because we wanted a front row seat. So we sit there for another hour. And then after sat there for an hour, they'd done about 30 minutes worth of singing. And then we got about 45 minutes to an hour worth of preaching. And then we got another 30 minutes worth of singing. And then we got another 45 minutes to an hour worth of preaching. And then we drove for an hour and listened to preaching on the way back. Hey, we need more preaching. That's what's going to change America. You're not going to make a difference in this world until you get some preaching. So starting from here on out, we're going to get some preaching around here at Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Let me tell you something this morning. Preaching satisfies God. It may not satisfy you, and you need it a whole lot more than you think you do, but preaching satisfies God. Every time that the man of God opens up this book, whether he preaches for five minutes or an hour and a half, it's good, amen, if he's preaching this book, and you need it. Preaching is something that we need. I don't hear anybody complaining about college football, <laughs> yet they have college games all day on Saturday. We ain't even in the message yet, y'all. They have college games all day on Saturday, starting at 12 o'clock, going all the way up until midnight. They have football season. Then after football season, they have a solid month of bowl games. Then they have football games all day on Sunday, starting at 1 o'clock, and then more games at 4.30. And then Sunday night football at 8 o'clock. Then they have Monday night football. Then they have Thursday night football. Then they have wild card games on Saturdays and all day on Sunday. Then they have the playoffs. Then they have their championship games. Then they have the Pro Bowl. Then they have the Super Bowl. I've not heard one person one time complain that there's been too much football in America. Oh my, but I've heard them say I preach too long. Right. I've heard them say we preach too much. Right. I've heard them say we go to church too much. Yeah. I've heard them say there's just too much going on. We Amen. can't be a part of that. We're too busy for right. God. But you'll sit there and watch all this football. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good preaching. Good. Baseball has spring training for months down in Florida starting in the spring. Minor league baseball teams play 150 games. College baseball teams play 56 games. High school baseball teams play 25 to 40 games in a season. And I bet you if your grandkids was in it, you'd be there. Each major... Amen, Brother David. Each major league baseball team plays 162 games in a season. Typically, the baseball season lasts approximately six months, starting from late March, early April, and lasts until late September, early October. Each of the 30 baseball teams will play 162 games during this time, resulting in 2,430 games per season. Then you have the division championships in the World Series, which is a whole seven games long. When's the last time you heard somebody say we're playing too much baseball in America? 
Well, no, but we'll complain that the church is doing too much. Just don't have time for that. Right. I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in and I'm going to listen to a 15-minute lesson and I'm going to go home. The Bible says a lot about preaching. Preaching, the word preach is mentioned 47 times. The word preacher is mentioned 11 times. The word preached is mentioned 59 times. The word preacheth is mentioned three times. The word preaching is mentioned 27 times. You know how many times the word preach is mentioned in the Bible through all of those? It's a total of 147 times. Don't tell me preaching is not important. Don't tell me you don't need preaching. Don't tell me that you don't need it because you do need it. Preaching is found in the Old Testament. It's found in the New Testament. Preaching was done by young men. Preaching was done by old men. Preaching was done on the street. Preaching was done in the house, church house. Preaching was done to the lost. And preaching is still for the church and those that are saved. Amen. Preaching can be short or preaching can be long. Doesn't matter how short or how long the message is, as long as it's true preaching. Amen. That's a different message. I just wanted you to hear that. <laughs> now we're going to go back to where I told you to in Acts. Chapter number 8, 7. Actually, I told you a lie. We're going over to 2 Timothy. Y'all don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. Why is preaching so important? Because you need it. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verses 1 through 5 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead is appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You know what my job is as your pastor this morning? To preach to you. Amen. That's what you pay me for. Amen. It's not to do weddings. God, nowhere in the Bible do you see Paul doing a wedding. It's not to do funerals. Matter of fact, Jesus said, go and let the dead bury the dead. You know what my job is here? To preach to you. Amen. Everything extra I do is because I love you and I care for you. And I All want right. you to know that. And as because I love you and I care for you, I'm to preach things that are not always in season. You're not going to like everything that I have to say this morning. And over the next few weeks, we're getting ready to start a series. I'll tell you about that in just a second. I wanted to do uh, a, a whole less, a whole message on this thought, but I couldn't because on my first point, I had seven pages of notes. There's no way I fit it all into one lesson, one message. Now in Acts chapter number seven. I've told you that I love you. I want to do this in the right spirit. I don't want to do it mean spirited. And I don't want you to think that I'm being hateful. And half the people that need this message are here anyway, as usual. But I want you to know I'm doing this because I care for you. And I, you need to hear the truth. And if I don't preach the truth behind this pulpit, you ain't going to hear it. Because you won't get it from Joel. That's right. Amen. Look with me at Acts chapter number 7. The Bible says in verse number 54. When they heard these things, Acts chapter number 7, verse number 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now we're going to go down to verse number one of chapter number eight. Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, 
He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Verse number four. Therefore they were scattered abroad, went everywhere. What? Preaching. Preaching the word. We have a story of a man named Stephen that was preaching a message through the Old Testament. You know what he's doing? He's quoting scripture and he's preaching the truth. Kind of like I do every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If you study chapter 7, all he was doing was quoting scripture and preaching it. You go back and study all that. We ain't got time to look at all that. You get down to verse number 54. When they heard these things, it said they were cut to their heart. Good preaching will do one of two things. It'll either make you hate your sin and get right with God, or it'll make you hate your preacher. Which one do you do today? Which one do you do today? Do you hate me for telling the truth? Does it irritate you whenever I get up here and preach? Paul asked the people out there at Corinth, he said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Does it irritate you that I get up here and preach on the King James Bible? Does it irritate you that I get up here and say you ought to be faithful to church? Does it irritate you when I get up here and I say that you ought to live right and do right and talk right and act right and smell right? Does that bother you this morning? Why should it? Because you're living in sin. That's mm -hmm. why. That's why you don't like it. This book will cut you and it'll make you mad. They were so mad that they literally began gnawing on this man. They literally began to eat his body. Now, some have preached that they were cannibals. Uh, and whether they were cannibals or not is unimportant. Uh, either way, they gnawed on his flesh, whether they ate him or whether they, that they were, the reason that they ate his flesh was because they were mad at him. And you say, well, we're not eating your flesh, preacher. Yeah, you are. Some of you. Some of you. Some of you are. When you go back and gossip and talk about the preacher when he's not around, that's just as bad as gnawing on his flesh. When you go back and you say, I don't like what he preached today. I don't agree with that. To, to other people, you're saying, you saying somebody here? So I don't know. I'm just giving you what God's laid on my heart. I'm just giving you the truth this morning. Somebody in here needs to hear this message. And somebody that probably ain't here needs to watch it on Facebook later when they find out when somebody in here goes and tells them I, I went and preached like I preached this morning because I know it'll happen. Somebody on Facebook needs to hear this message. Somebody in here needs to hear this message. They're beginning to bite him he begin, as he's beginning to preach Jesus. As they're beginning, uh, when he starts talking about Jesus, they begin to close their ears. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. No, you're not going to tell me that. I don't care. It's my life. It's my body. It's my choice. I can do what I want to do with it. I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. It's exactly what it was. We don't care what the Bible says. We don't care what you think that itching ears that I read just a few minutes ago. They want somebody to come in and just, you're going to be okay. Life is rainbows and unicorns and everything's going to be perfect and you're just going to live a happy life and you're going to live in a mansion and you're going to drive a Corvette. And that ain't life, y'all. Amen. That might be the way the televangelist portrays it. That might be the way some preachers portray it. But that ain't life and I'm here to tell you the truth this morning. You ain't going to like it. And I hate that you don't like it, but I've got to preach it anyway. Amen. And you're going to do one of two things. You're going to continue to go out here and run me down in front of everybody because you don't like what I'm preaching and say, well, he's not loving. He's not caring. He doesn't love like he ought to. Even though I've been with you and your families, even though I'm here with every event that we have, even though I, I'm faithful to take care of you, anytime you call me, I'm here. Uh, I, I've proven that over the past year, but I'm not loving enough. Because I preach too hard. It will cause you to hate your sin. Or it's going to cause you to hate me. Trust me. When you hate me, I hurt just as much as if you were gnawing on my flesh. Because I have a heart for you. Because God's given me a heart for you. Used to be at our other churches, I didn't care if people liked me. I didn't. I, I, mean, I didn't care. Didn't care what people thought. But I'm here now. And for some reason, when I hear you say you, other people, or the Lord reveals things to the preacher that you just don't know about, and, and he knows things that you just don't know about, and when the Lord reveals those things to you, it hurts. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
because I care for you and because I have a heart for you. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but y'all are my life. Y'all are my life. You may not physically bite me or stone me, but when you run your mouth, that's the same thing in your heart. We begin verse number 8 with a different man. His name is Saul. And it was Saul's fault that tragedy happened. Verse 3 says, Saul made havoc of the church. That word havoc there means to lay waste, to destroy, to cause destruction. That's what Saul was doing. As we all know, Saul later, it gets saved. Praise God. And he becomes one of the greatest Christians, probably the greatest Christian outside of the Lord Jesus Christ to ever walk the face of the earth. But he wasn't saved here. He was an outsider here in this text. In the, this historic event, Saul was an outsider to the church because he had not been yet saved. Here in the year, and by the way, Stephen's death was Saul's fault. Why do you think they took him and threw him at Saul's feet? It was Saul's fault. Saul caused havoc on the church as an outsider. Here in the year 2023, we have a lot of people in the church, not necessarily Webb's Chapel, but I'm talking about in the church in general, that have a form of godliness, but they have no power. They're not doing anything for God. Can I tell you that when you come to church and you leave this place, and you don't have anything different about you, and you don't do anything for God, and you don't tell anybody about Jesus, you just come here for the sake of saying, I came to church, you're destroying this church. That's right. You're destroying this church. I said, you're destroying this church. We know this because they show no fruit. We know they have no fruit, therefore, Bible says that we're to judge people by the fruit that they bear. When's the last time you bore some fruit in this place? Other than a complaint. Preaching to the church. Now. When's the last time you had some fruit? When's the last time you brought somebody to church with you? When's the last time you shared, those of you that are on Facebook, a Facebook post about the church? When's the last time you've handed out a gospel tract? By not doing these things, you're destroying our church. You say, how does a church dwindle down? Well, a church gets to a place where there's no excitement. There's no thrill. They're not fired up. Nobody wants to go there. You right. say, why is 85% uh, of our churches uh, at a place now where they're empty and it's all seniors and there's no young people? Because somewhere along the way, they've lost the thrill of Jesus Christ. Somewhere along the way, they've lost the excitement. It's become a routine. It's become a... I'm here because this is what I've always done. Hey, I want to stir up the waters this morning. I want somebody to get a hold of Jesus. I want somebody to get fired up. And we're not going to grow until you do. Some of you don't want us to grow. But guess what? We'll grow eventually. I don't plan on going nowhere. God called me here. And we'll grow even if we have to grow without you. We'll either leave you behind <laughs> or we'll let the weeds take you away. A lost person never does anything for Christ because they're more concerned with self. In essence, they're an outsider like Saul, but they've slipped their way into the church and they know how to dress and they know how to talk and they know how to look spiritual and act spiritual, but in all reality, they're an outsider. They don't belong in the church. They belong out there at the bar, really and truly, because that's what they are when they leave this place. An outsider. That's the kind of thing that destroys the church. Nobody wants to hear from a Christian that acts just like the world does. Right. Yeah. So you think the church is being destroyed by the inside, but it really is because we've let outsiders inside. There's people that may or may not be saved that are really destroying this church because they have no fruit. If you have no fruit, you're not saved. It's impossible. Unless right. you've just got a hard heart and you need to get right with God and get your heart softened. I do believe that you can come to a point as a saved, born-again Christian where you're so bitter, you're so upset about things that happened 30 and 40 years ago that really mm -hmm. don't matter anymore. And because of that, you're angry with God and you, 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 you come to church and you have a smile on your face and you act like everything's all right, but really deep down inside, that God knows you. Mm -hmm. I've heard it preached that most churches die from the inside. And I've lived in a church that is, I've went to a church and, been a part of a church that has died 
And I believe that's the fact of the matter. They do die from the inside. Amen. That's right. Without even knowing it, you could be destroying your church this morning. Mm -hmm. That was all introduction. <laughs> See why I have to do a series? I can't do it all today. We're going to cover one point this morning, and I'm going to go into the house. But I want to ask you this morning, are you causing havoc in the church? Before you say yes or no, you think about what I'm getting ready to say. <coughs> And I want you to study your heart because I want our church to grow. Amen. And most of us want our church to grow. I don't want, and I love you, but I don't want our ministry to just be us, the frozen chosen. Amen. I want us to get some life in this place. I want us to get some people in here. And we're going to have to do some things in order to do that. I want to give you seven ways, not today. We're giving you one way this morning. That you could be destroying this church without even knowing it. Number one, real simple. Just don't show up. We're going to talk about faithfulness this morning. The quickest way to destroy your church, just lay out. Don't come. Nobody's here. There's no church to be here. If everybody had the mindset that you do about coming to church, how would our church be? But I'm here for the business meetings that are important. Did I say that? Am I back here this morning? I come to every ladies' meeting that we have. I come to the senior fellowships. I come to this. I come to that. Where are you at during church? I'm not talking about that. Amen. That's extracurricular. That stuff really ain't even important. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. That's not important. The reason we do that is so that we can get to know each other. Really and truly, all a church really needs to do to be right with God is have Sunday morning preaching, Sunday night preaching, Wednesday night preaching. Everything else is extra. Amen. That ain't even, and none of that stuff's even required in your word in your King James Bible. If you can't come, I'm getting that way ahead of myself. <laughs> but if you can't come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you shouldn't be able to come to everything else that we have. Right. right. Your priorities are all backwards. Right. The case. That's Amen. right. And let me say this before you start making all these excuses on why you can't be here. I'm not talking about those that work a job. I'm not talking about those that are sick. And I'm not talking about those that are homebound. I'm talking about those that are just too lazy or they have other things that are more important to do than come to church. Amen. And that excludes vacation because I believe in vacation. Jesus had to break away. He broke away many times from his disciples. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that can come that are just so lazy or so preoccupied with the world and everything else that they don't come. That's what destroys a church. Right. Yeah. You say it doesn't matter if I show up. But you don't realize the impact it has if you're not here. Right. Yeah. right. Let's start with me, your pastor. Mm -hmm. When you don't show up and tell me that you, when you just don't show up, you don't text me, you don't call me, you don't give me any, any info, you just don't show up and you think, well, the, you know what my first thought is? I'm not even important enough for them to tell me that they're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. You say, you shouldn't think I I'm flesh. My first yeah. thought is, they're mad at me. Yeah. I've said something to offend them. I've said something. I'm putting you in my mind today. That's my first thought when people aren't here. Now, those that are here one week and here and, and in and out, yeah, I don't yes. think like that about them. I'm like, they're just not faithful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to the faithful crowd that's always here and you just don't show up, and don't, my first thought is something's happened or they're mad at me. That's the first thought that the devil puts in your pastor's mind. When I look around and see who's not here, it puts a damper on my message. Because I know I've spent 30 to 40 hours this week studying three messages. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Not counting Sunday school, the lesson that I give the teenagers every Sunday morning. <laughs> not counting that but I've spent 30 to 40 hours just this week studying for three messages that I'm going to preach and half the people that the Lord laid on my heart while I was going to preach it ain't even here they just don't show up you say what's the spiritual warfare of being a pastor I'm giving you insight on it this morning it puts a damper on me I look around and I see well this person's not here and you say well you shouldn't look at that I can't help it I can't help it I can't help it. I'm human. You do realize that while I'm preparing to preach, you are on my mind. I'm not thinking about everybody. I'm thinking about you. 
The Lord shows me something like, boy, that would help them. Boy, that would encourage them. Now let's look at how your absence affects everything else. If you're a choir member, the choir's got to sing without you. Mm -hmm. And no matter how big or how small your part is, it's important. Amen. Amen. Especially when there's only three or four people in the choir. That's a quartet. That ain't even a choir. Yeah. A couple times so far this year, we had not even had a choir because we hadn't had enough people. Because they didn't show up. Amen. Told you, either you're going to do this, I don't want to hear it, or you're going to get right. Mm -hmm. People come to church looking for you specifically. Right. Then you come for Sunday school and, I'm going to say it. You come for Sunday school and then you leave. Yeah. What do you think that, how do you think that makes me feel as your pastor? I'm not important. I understand things go on. <clears throat> You have you have to do what you got to do, I, but you, it's like it's not even important. I'm giving you my, my 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 mind this morning. I'm telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times different people come up to me and say, "Where is so and so at?" And right. you know the response I usually give them? I, I don't know where they're at. They ain't told me nothing. Mm -hmm. right. Well, you're the pastor. You should know. I I'm not high on their priority list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they tell the deacons yeah. and they tell this person and they tell that person, but not the pastor. Right. I mean, what? I'm just giving it to you straight this morning. Like I said, you can take it, close your ears up to it. You can get mad at me and go down to the church down the street and do whatever you need to do. This is part of a weeding process that we're beginning over the next year or so. We'll see who's faithful. We'll find out who's the wheats and who's the tares and who, who, who's who. Usually my answer is I don't know. But I sure wish they were here. Amen. Amen. I sure miss them. Yeah. Yeah. I sure miss hearing them in the choir. I sure miss seeing them. I sure miss getting to talk to them. Even if it's just a hello. A lot of you, we don't really talk, but I say hello to you, I speak to you, and I look forward to that. Amen. Even, no matter how small the hello is. Yep. When you joined this church, you made a commitment that you were going to be faithful. Right. Yeah. Amen. To right. this church. Mm -hmm. Not to the church down the street. Right. Not to the church over there in wherever else. Amen. You said, I want to be a member of Webb's Chapel Amen. Baptist Church. And you say, well, I believe we all support other churches. I agree 150,000%. That's why I go to other churches on Tuesday night and Thursday night when our church is not having church. church. Right. Amen, yeah. amen, amen, amen. Amen. I'm not saying we shouldn't support other churches. Right. They're having a singing on a Saturday night, I might go. They're having this, they're having that, I might go. <coughs> But I'm here at Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Church is gathering yes. together. Not because I'm your pastor, but because I've always been that way right. in every church I've ever been yeah. part of. Amen. Because I believe I made a commitment to the church that I was part of that I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. My family's meeting. I'm here. My family knows that. Christmas falls on Sunday. I'm, I'm in the house of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Jesus said that a man can't forsake mother and father and children. He can't bear his cross. He can't follow me. If he doesn't hate them. And your love for Christ and the church ought to be like hate when you compare the two. Mm -hmm. Let me say this, and I do care, but I don't, I'm not going to apologize, even if you get mad at me for it. If you can come to the men's meetings, ladies' meetings, senior fellowships, marriage classes, Easter egg hunts, BBSs, fall festivals, all the fun things that we do, you ought to be at church the next Sunday. Right. right. Amen. Yep. Church is more important than all of those things. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I've already got ahead. Told you I was getting ahead of myself earlier. If you can't be faithful to church, but you're faithful to other things, you need to get your heart right. If Amen. you can go to Walmart, you ought to be at church. Yep. Amen. Amen. Used to be shut-ins were really shut-in. They couldn't go nowhere. Now a shut-in is somebody that just says, I can't go to church. I go to Walmart. You know, COVID's not at Walmart. Yeah. Amen. We can go walk up and down every aisle in Walmart yep. and shop and do all that. Uh -huh. And we can go to work every single day. Amen. Right. We can't and we don't have the strength to go to church. Uh -huh. We just don't have it in us. Uh -huh. Priorities are out of whack. Amen. Now that you're mad at me, <laughs> let's go ahead and see what the Bible says about showing up at church. Let's go ahead and back it up with scripture. <laughs> Psalms chapter number 122 and verse number 1. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 
It ought to be a happy thought that you get to come to Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. Yes. Yes. When you Amen. wake up on Sunday morning, and I'm not talking about the getting out of bed process. I'm with you. That, that's hard every Sunday morning. Yes. I don't want to get out of the bed. I don't care if it is the church. I don't want to get out of the bed. <laughs> Just being honest. I'd rather stay in there and cuddle up underneath the covers with the fan on me. But when I get up, and I get to thinking about the fact that God gave me breath, Think about the fact that I've got a place where I can come to where I can worship if I want to. Amen. I've got an altar I can come pray on. I've got people to preach to, praise God. The house ain't empty this morning. Thank y'all for being faithful. I get to thinking about all those things, and it puts a joy in my heart. It gets me excited. And by the time I'm up, I'm ready to be here. Amen. Once I wake up, that, that, that wake up process. Yeah. And some of you, you only need one thing before you get to that point where you're just thrilled and excited, and that's coffee. <laughs> and I, Miss Faye, ain't that right? <laughs> <laughs> some of you just need a little coffee. <laughs> but it shouldn't be a dread to come to church. You should be excited when you walk through these doors. Amen. I believe the problem is all week long we've not had our mind on God, we've had our mind on our problems. We've had our mind on the news. We've had our mind on this. And I understand life gets busy. As a pastor, I'm way busier. I know y'all think I sit at the house and don't do nothing all day. But I, I have been so busy. Mm -hmm. I'm busier now as a pastor than I, than I was when I was actually working. I didn't think that would be possible, you know. I kind of thought, I like the idea of being a full-time pastor. I could sit around. <laughs> that ain't the case. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> But David said, I was glad when they said, let's go to church. Do you get your mind on your problems and your issues and life so that when you come in here, your mind's already full of everything else. That's right. And it's hard to be excited. Listen, it's not my job to get your engine started on Sunday morning, <laughs> Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's right. And it's not your job to get my engine started. A lot of preachers, they can't preach if nobody's shouting. I'll preach whether you shout or not. You don't have to get my engine started that way. I mean, I like it when you shout. But uh, I, I'm going to preach it whether you shout about it or not. Amen. Amen. When I'm here, my mind is on him. It's not on those other things. All of my problems fade when I begin to preach, when I begin to worship my Savior. This should be the happiest place on earth because this is the closest we're ever going to get to heaven without being in heaven. Y'all do realize that, right? Amen. We are at a place right now in the church the church is those that are saved. Yeah. And by the way, the church is not the building. I know y'all was wondering if I was going to go there. Or not. I was going to go to it in just a minute. But the church is not a building. This is the place where we meet for church. Amen. You are the church. Yeah. Which means if you don't gather together, you don't have church. Amen. Amen. Whether we gather at Webb's Chapel Baptist Church right here in the sanctuary, or whether we gather in the fellowship hall down there, whether we gather at New Life Baptist Church under the old tent, whether we gather out in the front yard out here, if we come together, we're having church. Amen. Okay? Amen. But this building is where we come for church. Amen. We have a designated time, a designated place, a designated area to have church. And you can't have that watching Joyce Meyer on television. Amen. Right. Yeah. Is she even on TV anymore? Okay. Please somebody tell me. Don't know. No. I was hoping somebody would say yes, so I know who listens to her. Mm. When I, <laughs> this should be the happiest place on earth because we're saved. Right. We're yeah. in yeah. church. We're supposed to gather together and worship. Yeah. You do realize while we're at church, I've already said that, I'm glad I have a place to worship. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 20. Y'all see why we couldn't do this in one? I, I still yeah. been preaching all day. Yeah. Lord help. I ain't even looked at the clock. I shouldn't have looked at it that time. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. <coughs> you want to know why we come together? Because God says he'll meet us here. Amen. We're two or three. We don't even need 50,000 people. We just need two or three. Just, just get Miss Faye and me and uh, one other person. We'll have church, praise God. I was bragging on you this week. I was. I was bragging on you. You, know, you just get two or three people in here. We'll have church, praise God. We'll worship the Lord. We'll cry. We'll raise our hands. We'll shout hallelujah. We'll throw our legs up in the air. That's what church is all about, being excited. Amen. Amen. You say, that's a bunch of show. 
If you say so, I can't control my excitement. When the Panthers win a game, I go, woohoo, yes! When we're playing volleyball and I smack the ball and it goes to where I want, yes! When I, when uh, Goldberg spears somebody and hits him with a jackhammer. See, David ain't even here. That was just for him. When Goldberg spears somebody and Jack gives him a jackhammer, I say, yes! When God moves in my heart, I say, praise God! Amen! Amen. Hallelujah! He's worthy! Yes. Say, why do we come to church to get a hold of God? Not to look at everybody else. I'm glad you're here. And I get upset when you're not here. But I don't come looking for you specifically. You're on my mind. You're in the corner of my eye. You ever walked in a room and been thinking about something and, and you know it's over there and you, you don't look at it, but there's one specific destination you've got in mind in that room. There's one specific person you come for and you know everybody else is there and you can see them out of the corner of your eye, but there's that one person that you're going to find and meet and that's Jesus. Amen. And I, I love you, I care for you, and I'm glad that you're here. But I didn't come here to meet with you. I didn't come here to talk to you. I came here to get a hold of him. Amen. Amen. And that's the idea that we need to have. Yep. The mentality that a growing church has, it's all about him. Right. I'm for fellowship. And if you say I'm not, you're a liar. I've proven that. We have so many fellowships around here. But when we come and meet on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, it's not about the fellowship. That's right. It's not about the handshakes. It's not about getting caught up with each other. You do that all week on the phone. It's about getting a hold of Jesus. Amen. It's about getting a hold of God. Yeah. It's about giving Him the praise and the honor and the glory and the worship that He desires and deserves from us. Amen. One reason to worship. We do all the catching up throughout the week with all the many things that we do around here. When we come in this building, we should be prepared to worship. You should come in with clean hands ready to worship, not hands that are dirty from the world. You should come in in your nicest, best clothes because God deserves that. If the President of the United States was coming to meet you, I guarantee you, never mind, y'all, y'all, some of y'all probably shouldn't even walk in. <laughs> that is not a good illustration. You could care less what the President of the United States, some of you could care less what he thinks of you. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a good illustration. Let's move on. We should have a mind to give God glory and praise because He's in the midst. He desires our praise and He'll come to where our praise is at. Amen. Got one more verse for you. Then we're going to finish it up. Hebrews 10, 25. You say, going to church ain't in the Bible. I've already given you three verses. I'm going to give you one more. Where you come to worship. You can't get a hold of God in a deer stand on Sunday morning by yourself. You say, oh, I can look at the creation. Hey, you can look at the creation. But you can't do you, you That deer stand ain't going to do for you what Webb's Chapel Baptist Church on a Sunday morning can do for you. You ain't going to get it watching live on Facebook either. You're not going to get it sitting at home on the couch listening to the preacher preach. You don't feel the same way. I know. I've been there. I've done it. When I'm sick... And I, I'm listening. I don't get fed like I do if I'm actually in church. That's right. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 25 is a commandment. Going to church meeting is not an option. Amen. You are to gather with those that you are to be assembled with according to the word of God. He said that we should come together. So that we can exhort each other. So that we can lift each other up. Hey, I need your prayer request. I need to hear them. And I ain't talking about on the prayer chain. I don't say I'm preaching against that. I'm not. I know how people are. They want to, he, he mentioned that. That means he don't like it. That ain't true. Don't you twist it. But coming here and hearing it is much better than hearing it over the phone. Right. Amen. Amen. When I hear it from you and I hear your emotion. Yeah. And I see your face as you're asking us to pray for your loved ones. I need that. Mm -hmm. it lifts me up. Let's me know, hey, I'm not alone in this thing. I'm not the only one that needs prayer. Amen. We ought to come to church so that we can hear prayer requests and lift each other up in prayer. Your presence here is an encouragement to me. Your presence here is an encouragement to the rest of the church. Amen. Yeah. You say it don't matter, but your Sunday school to your Sunday school teacher it matters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And your presence here is an encouragement to God, which should be more important than anybody else. A surefire way to destroy your church is just not being here. Number one, 
You want to destroy this church? Don't come when you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. Don't come when you don't feel like it. God will continue to work and move without you. But you're going to die in the process because you need this. Amen. And the more you lay out, the easier it's going to be for you to stay out. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Once you get to that place where you're out, you're out. Yeah. And usually 90%. Why do you think COVID ruined church? It's not just Webb's Chapel that's not full. Don't you get that in your mind that we're the only church in America that's not full. Matter of fact, we're fuller than 90% of most churches in America. Yeah. Yeah. Our church is doing good. Mm -hmm. God's blessing and God's working. And God's moving. We've got a lot of people here. But with every church, you know what happens on Sunday night? Like I seen that Facebook post, Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> Where does a crowd go from Sunday morning to Sunday night? Mm -hmm. right. Not here only. But I'm preaching to you. You're, you're my flock. I'm yeah. your shepherd. I'm your pastor. Yeah. And I can't control all the other churches in America. And I can't even control you, but I can tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. In closing, Brooke, April, whoever wants to come up here. Why are you showing up? Do you really think, or why aren't you showing up? When you miss church, don't answer this out loud, but why do you miss church? Do you really think that that excuse is going to fly when you stand before God? I can't control you, and I can't make you come. And God doesn't control people either. I believe he gives you the free will and the opportunity to do whatever you want to do. But I do believe you'll have to answer for the choices that you make. And I know in the end, you'll do what you want to do. And I can stand up here and preach till I'm blue in the face. And some of you are going to do this. Some of you are doing it right now. Somebody in here is going to get right with God today and they're going to start being faithful. I know in the end you'll do what you want to do, but as your pastor, you can't say it's because I didn't warn you. Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. Enters Jesus Christ. That's what we're here for. Why should we come to church? Because he's worthy. Amen. Is he not worthy? Yeah. To be faithful. That alone should give you plenty of reasons to be faithful. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ loves you. He paid your sin debt for you. And he's got a place in heaven waiting on you. That right there is worth it all. You stand up for me.